First of all, uh, I didn't count uh, on being able to sit next to a legend tonight, <laughs> but the name Paula Apsell has been something I've known and followed for over two decades. She is the creator and producer of NOVA, and in the hallway before the evening began, I asked her if she had a favorite episode of NOVA, one that she liked above all others. And she said, do you mean that I do I have a favorite child? Uh, and wouldn't say, but what you've seen tonight, I think is emblematic of what public television is about. To take a very serious and complicated issue in history and to divide it into its three naturally parallel constituent parts. The issue of uh, the burials at Pon Ponar, the terrible fort outside Vilnius, the mystery of what was left of the great synagogue of Vilnius, and then the, the overarching thing that brings all this together is the escape tunnel. Uh, I had heard stories of this as far back as, uh, I guess, the, the, my, the first time I returned to Germany after graduate school was in 1972. And at that time, there was, uh, there was a discussion among some historians at uh, the U.S. Document Center in Berlin ab about this issue. But this, it was one of those things that was sort of shrouded in mist. And it was in an age when stories were still apocryphal. Uh, when uh, things were impressionistic, when there was no uh, evidence to see it. And now you see the evidence of all of this. The other thing that this program does powerfully, I think, is to relentlessly, almost ruthlessly, set down in fact and in expanse how terrible the Germans were dedicated to the destruction of the European Jews, the extent to which they would go. The idea, as Heydrich said at the Von Zee conference, when every last Jew in Europe will disappear, every one, every single one, from the North Cape of Norway to the sands of Egypt, from the Bay of Biscay to the Ural Mountains, there will not be, for the Nazi New Order, there will not be a Jew left alive, not one, not even one. And, and here uh, you can see the, the clear evidence of how this was a priority that in the midst of a terrible war that demanded all the Germans had in the way of resources, manpower, wealth, and everything else, how this became a kind of distraction for them uh, a gift from the war, but something that was a priority that to them had a value that, that st for them stood above even making war, defeating the Soviet Union. Uh, I, uh, I'm really proud of the years that I worked in public broadcasting, and I'm really grateful to be able to see this uh, as uh, an example of what public television is all about. Megan Ferenczi, uh slipped me a, an electronic copy of this about two weeks ago and swore me to secrecy and not to show it uh, even to my one-year-old grandson uh, or let anybody else know that I had it or anything else. And the first time I watched it, I was just absolutely mesmerized uh, by how this was done. These are very gifted people who have left the world with something that I think is historically invaluable. Paula? Well, Charlie, can you all hear me now? So that is amazing. I'm going to take this off, okay? Amazingly kind of, of you to say, and coming from you, it's deeply, deeply meaningful to me. First of all, I'd just like to ask in the room, are there any Holocaust survivors here? Yeah, and could you sure stand you. up? England. Or anyone? Yeah from Vilna or who are descendants of the Vilna community. This, this is Inga Horowitz, who uh, left Germany 
uh, in the late 30s and made her way here. This is Dr. Roger Loria, who just retired from teaching in medical school, who was a child survivor, Belgian, whose mother managed remarkably to save his life as a two-year-old. This is Alex Keisch, who, along with his twin brother, was born in, near Krakow, Poland uh, in January of 1945 in the midst of the struggle between the Red Army and the Waffen-SS to keep control of the city of Krakow. It's a, it's a miracle that any of these three people survived. Thank you. So I, I hope you feel that this film did you the honor that you deserve because that was always our intention. And I think while we were in Vilna and while we were in Pinar Forest, you could really feel the presence of the thousands of people who sacrificed their lives there. And I think both Kirk and I and the whole team really felt the heaviest responsibility to honor the people whose remains were beneath us while we were there. And that was always in our minds as we were telling the story. I think the thing that struck me so much about this is how much I personally learned. Even though we had done a lot of research and Kirk wrote treatments and prepared us very well, that being on the scene both there and in Israel and talking to the survivors and talking to Richard and the other scientists, um, it was amazing to me how little I knew about the Holocaust. Even though I have a Jewish education and I went to Brandeis and I've taken innumerable courses and I realized while I was there that I knew nothing. The Holocaust bullets was something that I hadn't heard of. The extent to which the Germans relied on local people, the Lithuanians, and how that convinced them that the extermination of all of European Jewry was possible. That was something I never realized and really struck home to me even now in the world we live in when genocides are going on in so many different places that all it takes for terrible things to happen is for good people to do nothing. And so, you know, the film was really, I actually don't ever get the opportunity to direct anymore. I, I made 12 Nova films way, way, way back when. And I hardly ever get that opportunity. And Kirk was extremely generous when he saw how involved I was in the film to ask me if I would do that. And it was a, an amazing experience, first of all, to be in Lithuania and to be in Bernard Forest and to look for the mikveh in the temple. And then when the story broke, and we are often not news, and all of a sudden, NOVA, a science program, is in the New York Times, and as you saw on the slide, one of the most important science stories of the year. And that was what inspired the people from the United States, from Israel, and from Russia to reach out to us to tell their stories. And that was, and just being there while, they, while their stories unfolded was amazing. One more thing I just really want to add is, of course, I'm a science person. I've been a science journalist for many decades. And science is extremely important to me. And I think what really speaks to me about this film is having seen the film Denial. I don't know if any of you have seen it about the story of Deborah Lipstadt who's a, a Holocaust scholar at Emory University. She was attacked and actually accused and brought to court by the Holocaust denier David Irving. And she really had the run of her life in defending herself against that. And I, you realize from seeing that movie the power 
of these deniers. And to me, the importance here of science is that this is evidence, this is proof. And no matter what anyone says, and no matter how much memories fade, and they will fade, it can never be denied. And that, to me, that was the point at the end of the film, and that is really the importance. And I just salute Richard for bringing these new technologies to archaeology and not only making history come alive, but providing real evidence that can never be denied even by people who will go to any length to deny it. Okay, so what, what can I say to you about um, uh, how science is the next frontier for Holocaust studies? Mm -hmm. uh, in a few years, we will not have survivors among us. And one of the things that I, I hope that you, you see in this is that uh, who will tell our story? And I think science is um, going to be the frontier that will add so much to those hundreds of thousands of testimonies that have been taken. You know them from the Spielberg and the Fortunoff collections where people have taken all these testimonies. What can we do with these testimonies? So I'm gonna tell you one thing that I tell my students and that is we take the testimonies seriously. So when there were these testimonies about this, this tunnel that seemed to, how shall I say, agree, uh, it was out of the category of being mythological. It had to have, it had some other aspect to it, but finding it was very important. Um, we've done 30 projects worldwide on a new frontier of, of archeology span that I invented the term, so you can say it in my name, non-invasive archeology. span <laughs> Non-invasive archaeology, because archaeology is the most destructive science on earth. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, it's an experiment, you know, in science we do an experiment and if it doesn't work out, so you do it again. In archaeology, you can never do the experiment ever again. You get one shot at it and uh, for, for reasons that were uh, always uh, plagued the discipline, um, people would just start and dig and uh, they would find it, and even though they're doing it systematically, it didn't matter. They didn't know what they were digging for or what was below the surface. So about uh, 25 years ago, uh, I had the good fortune to come into contact with geophysics and geoscience, and they were using gas and oil industry, was using a technology to find gas and oil, and they wouldn't spend one cent to excavate if they didn't know, first of all, that it was there. And the second thing was, they wanted to know what was between the surface and the gas and oil, because they had to know what kind of drill bit to use. Mm -hmm. So I had the good fortune to work with a company, the largest gas and oil company in the world, Worley Parsons, uh, who I got to meet the people there, and I said, you know, the gas and oil doesn't have a great Reputation. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> they're fracking and they're tracking and they're tracking. It's terrible things, terrible things that they're doing. And I was able to say to them, how would you like to say on your website that you're saving civilization one site at a time? You should send geophysicists with us, with your equipment. And I just, so everybody's probably asking themselves the same question that most of these audience ask. How come everybody isn't doing this? No university could ever afford this equipment. But this is an industry. This is where partnering with an industry and bringing them into the field. So they loan this extremely expensive technology that has to be updated regularly. And they bring it out to the field. We pay wraparound insurance at the University of Hartford <laughs> to pay for, to bring it out to the field. These two geophysicists that come with us every summer always ask us where are we going this summer. And I have to say of the 30 projects we've done together, 
uh, this was personally very, mo very moving for me. And I think, that, as you already saw, that uh, my colleague John Seligman, I am an ancient archaeology specialist. I deal with the Roman period. John Seligman, who appears in this film also, is a Byzantine archaeologist. <laughs> and the one thing that connects us both is my great-grandfather came from Vilna, and his grandparents came from Vilna. And there's something very moving about being able, most of the, most of the places we excavate, I'm excavating the, the Church of the Annunciation, for example, in Nazareth. Things that happened 2,000 years ago, I can't talk to people about it. There's no people to talk, talk to about it. But what is very, very compelling about this story is when you say to students that archaeology is really not about walls, it's not about coins or glass or ceramics, it's really at the end of the day about people. We want to know about the people behind those artifacts. And to be able to meet and see and, and, and talk to these children and grandchildren of the survivors that got out of this tunnel was personally very, very moving because it, it brought to them some kind of closure. I, I should say that one of the grandchildren admitted to me, I never believed him. And he was, he was, you know, a kid. He was a kid. He was a kid. Well, I said, it was true. And your grandfather was telling you something. And now you can know that he was telling you the truth. How many times do we get to bring that kind of closure? You know, I, I remember watching that, The End of Schindler's List. Do everybody remember that movie? Where they all, all these real people gather at the, the grave of Oscar Schindler. And you feel that sense of how they were real people. It's not just some kind of movie. And the other thing is, and I, and I have to say this to you, because I know that there's, I'm looking around, I can see most of you will understand exactly what I'm saying. Part of our mission at the University of Hartford is I bring students out into the field. It takes double the amount of time to do it with the students. Did you know that? <laughs> you, you should, uh, I feel bad for the, the people who are documenting this, and I say, well, we have to, we have to do this again, because that person didn't. Usually I say that, <laughs> we have to do this again. Yeah. Part of the whole thing is to be able to teach a whole new generation of how to do this non-invasive archaeology. And if you're asking yourself who these students are, most of them are, are not Jewish. Why do they go and they do these things? They do these things because they are fascinated by real reality. You would be very surprised. I've been teaching 35 years in the university, and I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm telling any uh, secrets out of the school that 35 years ago, students were great in the classroom. They were not so great in the field, just so you know. Today, we have students that are not so great in the classroom. <laughs> they don't open books, but this is the most curious, most interested generation of people I've taken out to the field. So a lot of my colleagues always say, say oh, geez, oh, I, and they're always terrible. Oh, these students are terrible. And I say, not my students, <laughs> because they, meaning those millennials, you all know who I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> These millennials, they want to see it. They want to hear it. They want to taste it. They want to feel it. They want to experience it. And what we take this away, by the way, there's none of this in the, in the field. Did you notice that? There was none, yeah, yeah. They, there, none, none of that in the field. And they are really interested in real reality. So I have great expectations for uh, why I think uh, students in field experience will make this an extremely, extremely dynamic new study. And so science may ultimately be the, the savior for Holocaust studies. I 
I, I, will, I will be brief. Um, look, I have a great job. I get to go lots of places and I get to meet fascinating people and tell interesting stories and Paula Absol is a major benefactor of that and I, I would just, just want to thank her for that right now. But um, like, as Richard just described, you know, I grew up in a very small town in the 50s and 60s. There were no African Americans in that town. There were no Jews in that town to the best of my knowledge. Um, I went to college and I got a chance to make films and it opened my eyes a great deal and I certainly saw lots of films about the Holocaust. But I have to, I, not that I didn't believe it, but it was unreal to me. And I never really met anybody who'd been through it, so I had no evidence. And after all these years of filmmaking and all these different people that I've met, and we're talking over 30 years now, when I went to Vilna, Vilnius, it came on me like a ton of bricks. As Paula said, you cannot stand in the forest of Ponar and not feel the ghosts of the people around you. And throughout the making of this film, which became a very personal experience as we met the various uh, children of the survivors, the tunnel diggers, uh, people who had survived like Sam Bach, Asiya Friedman in, uh, in uh, Vilna, uh, it stopped being just a film and it started to be kind of a, a message. And I think that what I began to realize as we, as we did the film and we realized that the, the Holocaust survivors are quickly disappearing and there won't be any testimony left soon and the science will be the standing testimony, I realized that what I was doing was, God forbid, important, that it made a difference. And then as I watched the events politically uh, that have transpired here in the last year and you watch how other people can become the other and singled out for being different and should be parceled and put it over here while we deal with these people over there. And you begin to realize that history will repeat itself if we're not careful. And maybe of all the things, if people watch this film and come away with that, I'll be very, very happy. Thank you. And now, before we uh, start, I, I do want to, uh, I'm going to direct the first question from our Facebook Live audience. And we are on Facebook Live with this panel. And they, they've asked, how have the Lithuanians responded to this effort? And how are they recognizing this as part of their history? Last night, last night, last night. At this, at this time, I was at the Lithuanian consulate in New York City where I did this program. And, you know, I, I had to say to the Lithuanian consul before, when he invited me, he, uh, I said, you know, it's not saying great things about the Lithuanians, <laughs> I have to tell you. He says, you know, and he said to me, this is a man about 45 years old, he said, we are embracing our past. Now, I said, where were you 30, 40 years ago? But he says, things are, things are changing. And what's very interesting is he is now talking. When he goes around talking about Lithuania and the great discoveries that were made in Lithuania, what is he talking about? He's talking about the great synagogue, about the Ponar Tunnel. He's talking about the courage of those people who got out of the Ponar tu Tunnel. Now. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would say it's like moving the Titanic to change people in a country like Lithuania to be able to acknowledge who they, who, who they were and who they want to be. So in many ways, my colleagues that were working, and by the way, we work with Lithuanian uh, archaeologists and we work with Lithuanian museums and people who are very far from, how shall I say, jaded. They have very strong opinions about uh, what happened. And up until, by the way, until the, the Soviets left, whenever they referred to the Holocaust and what happened in Lithuania, they would always say, we were victims too. They're no longer saying that. So that was a that's been a major change. So if I have to say one thing, one country at a time. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the question was, how did, it, how did it feel to be in a, a country where there seems to be an upsurge of anti-Semitism, and that's directed to Dr. Freud? I worked in Poland at the Sobibor uh, extermination camp. We uncovered the entire extermination camp a decade ago. And every time we'd walk around and talk to people in Vladova, and they would ask us, are the Jews coming back? This, this was a, and by the way, this was a, one of the big concerns about, so when you discover the great synagogue, are all the Jews going to come back now? Yeah. And, they, and I, on the one hand, there were those who I think were worried that all the Jews would come back. It was 250,000 Jews in Lithuania. I just have to give you the, 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 the sense. Uh, and there are 3,500 Jews now in Lithuania. Um, so... Personally, there is never a moment during the time I was a month in the forest and working in Vilna that I didn't say, but for the grace of God, my great-grandfather left Vilna in 1903. Because if not, I would have been one of those people. At the same, oh, I'm sorry. So at the, but at the same time, I have to say that things are changing. There are always going to be those kinds of negative people in every society, but things are changing there. That's what, I, that's what I can say personally. And Charlie, did you have a comment? I do. Um, I, uh, my daughter once asked me how I did in science in college, and I said I never went near that building. <laughs> uh, but as a person who does not gainsay the, the benefits of science, particularly in this most dramatic fashion. As, a, as an historian, I need to put in a plug for history as the saving grace of Holocaust studies for one very important reason. The historian who is serious about this understands that the Holocaust deniers and the Holocaust revisionists are not stupid, crazy people. They have taken the time and the trouble to learn at least that portion of the factual part of the history that they can then uh, deploy or pervert or trade or some way pr prove their point. And it is to the historian, as it was to Deborah Lipstadt, a lady of incredible courage, it is to the historian to put into the record not only the factually accurate, the 100% unassailably accurate history of the Holocaust, it is up to the historian to make certain that the deniers and the revisionists are pointed out for who they are and what they are, and above all else, 
not to take for granted or assume uh, as someone who is uh, patronizing and condescending that these are boobs or idiots, because they're not. They are deadly serious people. I just have to add one thing to that. Because if someone asks me what NOVA is about, I wouldn't say science. I would say it's about the value of reason and the value of evidence. And understanding the process of science is how we see that evidence is the path to truth. And we live in a world where, and maybe it was always this way, but I see every day people like the Holocaust deniers who, in the face of evidence, simply deny it, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's climate change, whether it's that people of a certain religion have value, whatever it is. And so I think the lesson that we teach and the important thing for us as human beings all over the world is to learn to respect facts. You know, they say everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not to his own facts, and to learn how to reason. And that is what we try to get at in NOVA, week in and week out, affecting students, affecting teachers, and showing people the value, because that's the only way that we're ever going to be brought together and stop the kind of hate that's the basis of anti-Semitism and anti and racism and sexism and so many other isms is by respecting facts and valuing them as human beings. That's well said. That's well said. I've got two hands up, so I'm going to take this one and then Sam. Okay, please. Okay, so we mapped the entire subsurface of the Great Synagogue. Wow. Uh, it was at, it, GPR, ground penetrating radar, is very nice because we can do yards, miles worth of it. It collects all the data. It's a very quick uh, uh, turnaround. The, the big problem with the ground penetrating radar is that it only goes about uh, maybe eight, nine, ten feet below the surface. So at the Great Synagogue was great, wonderful. This electrical resistivity tomography, this ERT goes 120 feet below the surface, and it detects all the materials below the surface. So this is this is the difference. We're using two different types of um, of geoscience techniques together, and this is the new frontier because uh, unfortunately. For those of you who are not aware, we no longer just dig up people in the field. Not only Native Americans who have, been, have seen the affronts that have been done with uh, Native American burials, Jews are particularly sensitive, and we do not want to victimize the victims a second time. So part of this whole thing is to be able to document it, to know where these, these places are, to be able to uh, to see what is there, but at the end, to leave the dead in their place. And this is why this non-invasive archaeology is not just some kind of thing where we... I have to say that I'm working in, in places, in place, people's homes, because sometimes you don't want to be able to destroy everything inside the home to know what's below, b below a house. And so this is a new frontier also for archaeology. So it, ground penetrating radar is operated by ground penetrating ra radar specialists. It's not somebody who just, although I have to say it, this is a, I don't know if you like these anecdotes, I'm sorry if you don't like them. Um, uh, the chief rabbi of Poland, after he saw what we did at Sobibor, bought for the chief rabbinate a ground penetrating radar uh, device for the chief rabbinate. And I said, Rabbi. Uh, you know, of course, that it's not about the technology. It's about the operator. It's about the person behind the technology who's actually able, like a radiologist, 
who would be standing there to interpret what's, what's going on here. He says, I know, we'll find the right people. <laughs> Sam. Okay. Well, one thing I will say is I have 20 books that I, I had schlepped up here uh, from Hartford, and if I sign the book for you, and you can read all about all these other excavations that we've done, uh, if I sign this, you can sell it on eBay for twice the price afterwards. Uh, I discovered it. I was in Michigan. Suddenly, I saw all these books coming up with my signature on it, and they were selling them twice the price of what, what I was, was selling them for. But it, people should read. And the other thing is, I am trying to, we are trying to do something very different. So in the case of the documentary, we have a, an app for your phone that will be live on April 19th. We will be able to see aspects of this whole thing on your phone. And what we've discovered is not everybody's reading books. But if you, it's a free download from iPhone and Android you'll be able to actually scroll through and see a lot of the, the, the history. Um, all of the aspects of these kinds of archaeological projects is really the idea of discovery. And what's very good, I have to say, is next summer we're going back to Lithuania. I know somebody's asking themselves, they're going back to Lithuania? Yes, we have a lot of work that we didn't finish. Uh, you're, we're sitting in front of the Coral Synagogue here. I'm going to Kovno to work on four sites in Kovno. Uh, and it, Fort 9, Fort 7, Fort 4, and one of the, uh, the cemeteries there. This is an ongoing process, but it's not only about the Holocaust. This is in order to, to I think, I think you're probably uh, getting the same idea I, I have. When we need to, to give evidence for genocides all over the world, this will be the technology yeah. that will help us in the future. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, 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 there will be uh, future genocides. We have to prepare ourselves and to document it. And that's one of the things that I think, uh, uh, that I'm so happy when I teach students in the field, they say, uh, you know, I'm really not gonna go into this. And I said, but you'll use it for the rest of your life. So that's the one thing I can say about this. Yes, sir. One of the subtexts that I picked up on in the film was that the Russians really had an influence in erasing what was left and the memory of these events in Vilnius. And so for anybody who's interested, I'd like, I'd like you to make a few comments about that and about the, the Cold War and the Soviet Union's influence on how we remember the Holocaust, or at least how we and how the fall of the wall might have influenced how we study it since. Maybe uh, we'll be here for a long time. Well, yeah. yeah, maybe Charlie take a shot, and then I, whoever wants to chime in, no, if that's okay. I'm not. I, this is just very brief. I think it's it's worth remembering. Uh, I always say that the three keys to anything like this, a question like this, is chronology, context, and common sense. And the last part of Stalin's reign as General Secretary of the Communist Party, dictator of the Soviet Union. Between 1951 and 1953, uh, he un unleashed a purge against, uh, well, there was a so-called doctor's plot, which involved a number of Jewish physicians in Russia. He had the famous Jewish actor Mikhoels murdered uh, by the chief of the uh, NKVD, uh, and he was actually in the process of building a case against Molotov, his foreign minister and the premier, uh, because of uh, the, the, the Jewishness of Molotov's wife. Uh, Stalin had uh, 
a hatred of Jews, harbored a hatred of Jews that was not Hitlerian in the sense of its, its all-encompassing uh, hold on him, but he saw Jews as a potentially lethal, deadly source of conspiratorial anti-Soviet activity. So uh, wherever the Russians went west after 1945, they were more than willing to simply uh, touch off the work of demolition and destruction that the Nazis had already pretty well uh, undertaken. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what's part of this. And then beginning with uh, Khrushchev and then through the, the regimes of Brezhnev uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the old KGB guy who followed him, the, uh, you know, th there's this pathological fear of the West and the, the concept that, that the Soviet Union might be invaded again from uh, Western Europe. So let's hold on to the Baltic states Poland, uh, the, the other satellite states in, in southeastern Europe, let's hold on to these. And in these states, use repression against those who even culturally, culturally exhibit anti-Soviet tendencies. And that's a code word for meaning Jews. Uh, so the, the uh, yeah, I mean, the Russians were, they, the idea that the Jews of Lithuania thought they were being liberated by the Red Army, you know, shows how far from the political realities of the Second World War the partisans, the Jewish partisans in Lith Lithuania had become hmm. by 1944. So I, I'm not an expert in this, but I have worked with Refuseniks, the Jewish scientists who were, um, who were really excluded, lost their jobs, were, you know, just had horrible lives, and many of them were eventually able to emigrate to the United States and to Israel. And, you know, the, I think the only, the evidence that you need is when the Germans, the Germans did bomb the, the great synagogue, but the Russians flattened it and built a school over it. And honestly, what more evidence do you need than that? It's like saying, please don't come back and we're going to obliterate your history. But I saw in the New York Times the other day that now they're really, the Russians are after the Jehovah's Witnesses. Seriously? You're after, you're, you're trying to wipe out the Jehovah's Witnesses? And you know that when there's bias and hatred like that for any one group, the Jews can't be far behind because it's all part of the same thing and it always then falls and becomes anti-Semitism. That's why I think it's so important for Jews to protect other groups that are being discriminated against, partly because it's the right thing to do, but partly because it's self-interest, because when there's hatred, there will be hatred for Jews, and I don't think that's too paranoid. I think history has proven it time and time again. There's one, one small anecdotal story about the, and it's in the film, that speaks to this and uh, the, the Torah scroll that was, uh, we saw a guy take it out of the back of his car and that was a honest to goodness real scene, happened without any setup, we didn't know this guy was coming, he walked into the synagogue dig site that we were at with the Torah scroll and I said who is that guy and they said He's got something he wants to deliver to John Seligman and the team. I said, good, go put it back in your car. We're going to get a shot of you taking it out of your car. <laughs> and we did. And then he told the story about how his father, in 1960, this is long after the Nazis were, were done. In 1960, Jewish elders had gotten together. They were obviously, at, Vilnius was behind the Iron Curtain at this point. And, uh, they took this Torah scroll and they gave it to this man's father and said, please get this out. Please smuggle this out. Because if it stays here, it's going to be destroyed. And so he did. And that Torah scroll was in London and a couple of other cities for probably 25, 30 years. And uh, it, the guy had it in his house. And he said, uh, his son said to him one day, Dad, don't you think it's time that that thing went home? And so he put it, 
you know, in a sack and he brought it back to, to Vilnius and he walked onto the site that day and we literally caught him just bringing this thing back. And I just thought it was profound because so much was destroyed that to have one thing that was authentic and that, when we authenticated that, that scroll, it goes back 300 years. That's 300 year old scroll that's been in that, at least that vicinity, if not that very synagogue for that long. And uh, for so much that's been destroyed, to be able to bring that back, I thought was important. So. I'll say one thing about this. You'll love this to use this. It's called the law of unintended consequences. And here's the law of unintended consequences. The Nazis destroyed the synagogue. The Soviets demolished it. And what they did was they did it in, in typical Soviet style. Instead of, when they built the elementary school, instead of digging out the, the, the entire basement, and the, they just put a nice cement piece down, and then they built the, the, uh, the elementary school on top, ironically preserving all of the materials below the surface. That's good. Yeah. So that's the law of unintended consequences. That's right. And you have to be ready for that. <laughs> We can take a, uh, about two more questions if anyone has something on their mind. Yes, sir. So I will tell you about Father Patrick Dubois, who I think is the person that you're referring to. Father Patrick Dubois is a, a Roman Catholic priest who's in Paris. He has an organization, Yachanum, and he is out there looking for the places where Jews were killed by their neighbors, and their neighbors took their houses. And he basically is going around to people's houses, knocking on the door, and saying, I know what you did. I'm not going to the authorities. I want you to be absolved. You have to show me where they're buried. And he's going all throughout Eastern Europe. So Father Dubois and I met to talk about this because I, what, what does he do once he finds where these people identify where these graves are? That's another question. So I said to him, oh, we're gonna be in Lithuania next year. I'm gonna be, so he says, I'm gonna be in Lithuania next summer. I said, that's wonderful, we'll work together. I said, how many sites are you doing? He says, 22. I said, you're doing 22 sites? I have to get a permit for every single site that costs a lot of money, and not only is it an extremely, to keep all my equipment and scientific credentials, I have to get this permit and work together with. So I said to him, I looked at Father Dubois and I said, do you have 22 permits? And he looks at him and he goes. <laughs> I said, it works for you, but it doesn't work for me. <laughs> yes, sir. Wendham. April 19th, 9 o'clock, Nova. And that's where you'll see it here, and it will air all over the United States. Colin Carrick. Yes, ma'am. The app is Archaeology Quest, colon, Vilna. And if, by the way, I have another one. Uh, it, each, each time we do an archaeological uh, site like this, people will be able to go to the, and get it on their phone, and it's free. It's a free downloadable information with photographs and text. And I just have to say one thing. If you'd like to find out more about the children, of the tunnel diggers. Um, that will be on our website, which you can get um, through 
WCVE, you can get to the NOVA website. And so there's more material. There's also a really interesting sequence that we couldn't fit into mm. the film on the paper brigade, which I think really shows how sick this whole thing was, that the Germans were killing, Nazis were killing all the people, but they wanted to preserve all the papers and the books and everything that, uh, that, that the Jews had written. And ironically, Sam Bach survived, they kept some of this stuff stored in a convent. Right. And ironically, Sam Bach, the artist, when he escaped from the bag that his father was holding him in, he ran and ran and ran and ran and ran, was reunited with his mother in this convent and hid in an igloo of the papers and books that the that the paper brigade had correct had collected, and that's what s saved him from the Germans. So you can find that all on our website. And ladies and gentlemen, with, with that, let let me say some thank yous. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the panel. Th these are all VIPs. <laughs> And honestly, any one in their own right would have been an outstanding person to speak to you and for you to ask questions of. And I admire their ability to share uh, with one another and, and allow each other to have their moment. And that's sometimes hard to do. Uh, second, uh, Dr. Freund, he didn't bring enough books, but he's got some books, um, 20 books. And for those of you who might be interested, he will be back here and will be signing them. If, if you are of a mind, I think they're $20, and that's uh, a great deal. Uh, third, while these are VIPs, please understand that the real VIPs to us are you. You're our community, you are our supporters, you support this museum, you support us, and anytime you grace us with your presence and your time, we're reminded that we are only effective with a strong community and with VIPs like you, so thank you. Uh, now, I, I do wanna thank two people in particular, uh, Catherine Mitchell from our company, and Megan Forenzi from the Holocaust Museum. Together, they really are your hosts. Yeah. <laughs> so please drive safely again. I, I thank you. And with all the crazy stuff going on in the world, when there are people like you who are good, decent people who care about the right things, We'll all wake up tomorrow. There'll be a doorknob on the inside, and it will be a good day. <laughs> it has been an honor to meet you, brother. And I, uh, I hope uh, Nova keeps coming. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, you've got how far ahead of the production of